Today's scripture verse is an Old Testament scripture. It's the Psalm 23, which all of you know. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. For even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and may the meditations of my heart, O Lord, be acceptable in your sight. Oh God, my strength and my redeemer, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Many of you are old enough to remember the American comedy slash drama, the movie or the film, Guess Who's Coming? to dinner, anybody, anybody, if you're under 30, you probably don't know much about that. It's a classic that opened uh, in New York, um, December 11, 1967. And then the next day it was released throughout the whole country. It, in, 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 in this particular film, Joanna Drayton, that's the character played by Catherine Halton, is a 23-year-old Caucasian woman who's returned from her Hawaiian vacation and has come home with the character Dr. John Wade Prentice who is a 37-year-old widow, widower. And that's played by the legendary Signa Portier. And so unbeknownst to her Caucasian parents, Catherine brings not only a much older man to dinner, but a black man to dinner. Now, you can imagine the audacity of the writers and producers of this film, uh, particularly during a time when interracial marriages were illegal in 17 of the 50 United States of America. And so in a very real sense, such an occasion uh, with, with a dinner guest like that is uncomfortable and disconcerting to the guests. And I'm sure that uh, dinner guests are usually invited anyway. And now this black man has come to dinner in a space that was unacceptable. I mean, after all, it is an honor to be invited to dinner, but you gotta be invited. And, and so let me say, let me just take out a moment of personal privilege, Kathy, and say thank you to all of y'all who invited me for dinner. I, 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 I'm, I'm grateful for that. Had dinner just this last week over the Tentures. That was wonderful dinner, good food. And many of you have invited me over 
for dinner. And uh, let me say right here that I'm not uh, gonna turn down a free meal at any time. Uh, and so uh, until God eventually grant me the presence of Steve or Mrs. Wesley, uh, I'm not turning down any free food. Let me just, amen, let me just say that real quick. Uh, but you didn't come here, right, uh, for, at 9.30 to hear me talk about interracial dating. You didn't come here at 9.30 to hear me talk about dinner invitations, did you? And so, Daryl, you say, where are you going with this? And moreover, what does this conversation about dinner and being invited to dinner or not invited has to do with the 23rd Psalm? You already know my reply to that, and that is, I'm glad you asked. The title of the sermon, Faye, it is posed as a kind of rhetorical question. I'm going to take my time this morning. I, I noticed that I got up at 10 till, so I got plenty of time. Amen. Guess who's coming to dinner? But implicit in the question is the acknowledgement of the host. Because you cannot have a dinner unless somebody invites you to it. And so... As important it is to be invited to dinner, watch this, it's also important to focus on who has invited you. Psalms 23 is a beautiful poem. It is moving and melodic. It is a poem that we all probably can recite without reading it. We can say it by heart. I bet you that even the kids probably can say the 23rd Psalm. It, it, it is a poem used to provide comfort. It is a poem that, that seemingly in some way gives its readers hope when they're experiencing moments of hopelessness. But contextually, watch this. Psalms 23 is what scholars call a psalm of trust. That is to say that the psalm here bears witness to the faith of its author, but also it bears witness to the faithfulness of the object of his or her faith. So as my Old Testament professor Tony Ash would often remind us that in the Old Testament, there is one major hero, and it's God. So let's look at the poem. Let's look at how this beautiful account acknowledges our faith. It is a short poem consisting of six verses. And as the case with poetry, it is, as it were, clothed in metaphor and symbolism. Y'all stay with me. I'll be where you want me to in about three minutes. The first verse notes the comparison of God to a shepherd and its writer as a sheep. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures, these metaphors of the comforting care that a shepherd has for a sheep. He goes on to say that this shepherd, amid the pilgrimage of valleys and shadows of death, that the shepherd provides a rod and a staff for protection. But then at verse 5, Reverend Cheryl Lynn, the poet, changes metaphors and transitions from the image of God being a shepherd to God being a host. Listen to the words, thou prepares a table before me. That's, that's host talk. In the presence of my enemies, thou anoints my head with oil. That's, ho- that's host talk. My cup runs over. 
And so now we move to the motif of hospitality. So it's not just now, my brothers and sisters, a question of who's coming to dinner. That's important. But it's also a matter of what happens when you get to dinner. So the God is the host. And in and, 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 and Jewish protocol, in Jewish life, hospitality meant everything. Hospitality includes the host seeing travelers from a distance and running out to greet them. Hospitality reveals and shows that the guests is brought into the host's dwelling and private space. The host also provides food, which is often more extravagant than originally promised. The host protects its guests. The host provides a kind of relationship that the guests would want to return back to his house for dinner. It's something when you go to somebody's house for dinner and, and the food is just that good, isn't it, that you want to just keep going back. Um, uh, uh, this is not in my notes. I just got this. But I remember um, John, John Big brought me to an Italian restaurant called Napoli's or something like that. And I tell you, ever since he's brought, taken me to that place, I keep wanting to go back and go back and go back. Uh, I just love that. So it's, it's a wonderful thing when you got a good host and you got good food. And so God is a good host. And so guess not only who's coming to dinner, but guess who's hosting it. God hosts the dinner. And I love the psalm because the psalm is, reveals to us some, some particularities about how God does his hosting. God, first of all, God provides an ambiance that is the envy of your adversaries. Listen to the words. He says, God prepares a table, watch this, before me in the presence of my enemies. That's some kind of meal, isn't it? That you can be, that you can, you can that your enemies would look and be the envy of, of how God prepares a table in the presence of our adversaries. And then not only does God uh, provide the uh, an ambiance that is the envy of your adversaries, then God acknowledges your importance at the meal. He says, the psalmist says, God anoints his head with oil. That's amazing because whenever a special guest is brought to dinner in Jewish custom and protocol, one of the things you want to do is you want to Provide anointing for their heads. And you want to anoint them with oil, which, which reveals your importance. Let me pause and say to you, as you already can understand, that all of you are invited to this wonderful, this wonderful feast and meal, this, this opportunity to, to, this opportunity to fellowship with God, who's the greatest host that God will provide an ambiance for your enemies to be, to, to be envious. And that just simply means that no matter what's going on in your life, God says to you that God will protect you and God will keep you even in the face of adversarial moments and in the face of difficulty. God prepares a table in the presence of your enemies and then God also reveals to you that you are important. No matter who you are, no matter where, you, where you're from, no matter uh, your level of education, you are important to God. Look at yourself every day and, 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 and remind yourself of the, of the words of another psalmist that when he described himself to God, he says, I am, uh, the psalmist says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God shows you that you're important at this meal, at this fellowship with God. And then not only that, like a good host, Sam, is that if you're like me, I never finish my meal. And so I'm always given leftovers. Somebody said amen to that. I guess somebody remember, knows that. And so God will leave you with invaluable leftovers. Listen to the psalmist. He says, 
Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. In, in other words, when, when, you, when you leave God's uh, banquet and God's monk of fellowship with God, God won't let you leave alone. God will make sure that God's grace, that God's goodness and God's mercy will stay with you all the days of your life. And then finally, and this is the point I want you to get, Redlands First United Methodist Church, is that at God's banquet, God invites everyone and excludes no one. Because the context here, the subtext, if you will, is the idea of a stranger coming to dinner. It is the idea that the stranger who comes needs protection against adversaries. That's why it says, but pass the table before me in the presence of my enemies because strangers, non-Jews, are invited to God's banquet. Everybody is invited and no one is excluded. And that simply says to us that, that, that when you raise the question and you give the answer, guess who's coming to dinner? Jews are coming to dinner. Gentiles are coming to dinner. Catholics are coming to dinner. Protestants are coming to dinner. Straight, gay, lesbian, transsexual people, asexual people are coming to dinner. All races are, are coming to God's dinner. Red, yellow, black, and white, you're all precious in God's sight. Muslims are coming. Democrats are coming. Republicans are coming. Independents are coming. God's dinner invites Everyone and excludes no one. And then the psalmist says, then when it looks like that, it's a wonderful dinner because everybody will be invited and want to come back. Listen to the words of the psalm. He says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, now that does not mean, now people often have a conversation, a theological conversation about what happens after death and, and, and what, whether we go to heaven or whether we go to hell. And, and, and that's a conversation that you, we can have. I don't have an answer for you on that one. But, but when the text says that I will dwell, that means literally in Hebrew, I will return. I will return to the house of the Lord, and forever simply means the length of days. So what the psalmist is saying, that God's meal is so great. God's hospitality is so amazing that, that I, I can't wait to get back there. I, 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 will, I will return to God's house. Let me say to you, my brothers and sisters at this church, that if we're going to be hosts like God, we got to make, we got to prepare a, a, a predicament and a table such that when people come into our company, they say, I will return to Redlands First United Methodist Church. All the days of my life. And so, and so I'm, I'm so glad that the psalmist is, is, is revealing to us that we can always come back to God's place. And, and, and you want to talk to me about what heaven looks like? Here's what heaven looks like to me. Heaven looks like when, when we all are here. And there is no color, there is no race, there is no gender, there is, there is no sexuality that, that we can all come together and dwell in God's house. And that it does not matter who you are, that, that, that there will be no more distinction. That's what heaven looks like to me. Heaven looks like to me that there, when we will study war no more. Heaven looks like to me when it does not matter what, what, what your level of education is. Heaven looks like to me that when we all can get together and, and, and give God praise for how good God has been to us, that God loves us despite how we love ourselves. And so I'm, I'm reminded of the song that I used to, we used to sing when I was growing up. Uh, I, I love it. It says, when we all get to heaven, what a day. I feel my Baptist kicking in. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all, y'all excuse me for a minute, see Jesus. I, when we all get to heaven, when, when, when we all get together and, 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 and share in, in fellowship at God's table, what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. 
will sing and shout the victory. Guess who's coming to dinner? All of us are coming to dinner. And guess what happens? God trans changes us and makes us better. God shows us that we're loved. God shows us that we're important. God shows us that our adversaries won't have the last say. God shows us that we are always will have with us the, the leftovers of God's goodness and God's grace and God's mercy so that we can come back to get it over and over and over again so that we can be better and do better so that God can be glorified and God can be magnified. You're all coming to dinner, the word of God for the people of God.